rise and receive the call to worship. There is a notable event that's recorded in the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, an event which would be the building of a highway for the remnant of God's people. And this would be as it was for Israel in the day that they came up from the land of Egypt. In that day, this is what the prophet says the people will say. In that day, you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, though you were angry with me. Your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Beloved people of God, Jehovah is our strength and our song. We need not fear. We have every reason to rejoice in him, no matter what's going on in society or even in our lives. Jehovah is our strength and our song. And this because he's our helper. He's made the heaven and the earth, and he would be our helper and our savior true in Jesus Christ. Receive God's benediction. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto you from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 48, Jehovah is my light and my salvation near. Who shall my soul affright or cause my heart to fear? While God my strength, my life sustains, secure from fear, my soul remains. Let's sing the stanzas one, two, three, and five, omitting the fourth of 48. to confess and faith with which to confess it. Believer, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day... 
He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue in our worship in song number 211, which rehearses the care of God for God's people, and also as they were led safely through the sea, stanza 8 and And the foes were overwhelmed, and so that their faith was stirred, and for the time their songs of praise arose. We're going to be considering the songs of praise that arose at the parting of the Red Sea. Let's consider or sing 1, 2, 3, 8, and 23 of 211. I believe that at this time in the Exodus, as we're about to exit our series in the book of Exodus, the people were overwhelmed by the wonder of it all. And the, the glorious God of wonder who is wonderful and who does wondrous things. And let's think about that as we pray and in all of our worship, the rest of our worship, we, the congregation, those who are visiting with us, I'm glad you could be here to join in the wonder of of the wonderful gospel we have and the great deliverance of the exodus from sin. So with wonder on our mind and therefore reverence and joy, peace with God, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thanks for the one whose name is wonderful, even Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, the wonderful God of our salvation is Jesus and the government is upon his shoulders. And he's ascended on high to your right hand there to reign with all power and authority, fulfilling his great commission through the church to save his own all for whom that lamb's blood is shed, that we might be taken to heaven and a highway might be made for us as you are making it now, that we might go the quickest route to heaven, the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey, 
You are God, and faithful are your promises, and faithful are you, though we be faithless. And we pray then in confidence, fulfill your will for us, Lord, and in us, and help us to taste and see just how good you are. And for our worship service, we pray that you would so condescend to be with us, who come in Jesus' name, that this is indeed the sanctuary of all sanctuaries, the human heart, the divine church, in which you settle here and you dwell here among us and you shine and you make us happy, you give direction, you give rebuke, and in every way you lead us closer and closer to glory. We pray, Father, that the congregation may know this presence of God and that also those who might be in unbelief might turn to you and be converted and regenerated then with us to have that, that life's, uh, life's principle bear fruit in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us a song, renew the song in our lives, a song of joy, a song which means we're not of this world, though we're in it, we're of heaven. We're bound for glory where the company of just men and women and children made perfect, they do sing with perfection. And where there are these glorious creatures who themselves join in the praise of God, but there is especially the song of Moses and the Lamb, which is the center of the attention and singing of the people of God. May it be, Lord, that tonight we're drawn into that heaven to that heaven's experience and reality, which is even more real than the noses on our face, faces and anything we can see or smell or touch on this earth. Heaven is real because God is real, the author of all reality himself, the great being of all beings. We love you, Lord, for showing yourself to be such a God who is like unto you among the gods, Lord? No one, no God is like unto you. So we exalt your name in our prayers, in our singing, and we trust in the preaching tonight. Your servant bring the word of God, which is of God, primarily a theological word centered on the truth of God, who is wondrous in being and in doing. And may we hear then and know the God who is our God, our Savior. And we pray that we might know the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. Bless us so that we might believe you and your Son, even as the people of Israel believed Jehovah God and Moses. So we believe the fulfillment of the type the great prophet and priest and king of our salvation, even Jesus. And so, Lord, here we are, your people, and at your mercy, which is the best place for us to be, for we trust in your mercy. We trust that you will guide us. Maybe there's some who have especially difficult trials in life that are weighing upon their minds that are dragging their souls down that keep them from normal activity and work in the home, in church, and among the relationship and in the neighborhood. Lord, we pray, bless us that we might cast all our burdens upon you, knowing that you care for us, and you will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Only let that be the case, Lord. Give grace so that we can think just on you. There's much to think about in these days, in these tumultuous times, when the wicked, like the troubled sea, cast up mire and dirt, and they would confuse even the people of God if it would be their will accomplished. And they would give us to think that their evil is good and their good is evil, and all kinds of distortions they make. And God, we pray, give us to be wise in this world to think on things above, to think upon the gospel of the good news in Jesus Christ. Indeed, as we're reminded apostolically, may whatever is of good report and praise and virtue and 
any such good thing that is a gospel good thing, may this be on our minds. So may our minds be transformed. May our lives follow our minds and our minds our hearts and our hearts the Lord Jesus and the revealed word of God. Thanks for the Bible, Lord, the great infallible because inspired word of God. Your very breath you breathe out upon the nations to make your will known. And the church is the, the great repository of truth. You've given us to be the pillar and the ground of truth. And this we've known since the day that you called us to be an instituted church some 10 years ago, 11. What a wonderful day that was and still is because you're still working in us, grounding us on truth and giving us to, to know that there is a blessing for God's people and God's church, no matter what the hardships the church goes through, no matter the battles, you are the God of war and the man of war, and Jesus Christ revealed. And Pharaoh and his hosts, they're cast into the Red Sea and drowned, overwhelmed. So all our enemies. In our trials, Lord, we pray, make them to serve us and to be not enemies but friends. Even evil people or difficult distresses and circumstances of our life that would unsettle us. May we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. All things, not one does not work for good. Not one, not two, not a hundred. All work for good because you are the worker. And you are working in and over and through all things to glorify your name in keeping us. And not only that, not only so that we hang on, but so that we walk uprightly and the exalted and happy and victorious life, not as those who are unmindful of evil, who have a long way to go, but as those who triumph in Christ because he has overcome the world. Thanks, Lord, for the cross, the wonderful word of the word, the message of God with sinners reconciled, the message of atonement, the message which grounds all the truth to be true all the way to heaven and forever. Lord, we pray, have mercy upon us in this world and in this nation. Give us freedom and peace. We pray for the rulers and all in authority over us that somehow, Lord, you would work your will in their lives, that there might be, they might be the rewarders of good with the steel sword and also the punishers of evil with the steel sword and the threat of punishment and even death. We pray, Father, for that liberty which we cherish in our nation. We might still maintain that, that the gospel may be promoted by the church of Jesus Christ. And we, Father, among all your people in this land and in all the world, might be the heralds and ambassadors of truth until the kingdom come. Though we know, Father, the days of Antichrist are approaching, perhaps he's yet alive, in which there will be much confusion in the church, and we see this. The great apostasy is among us. There's a falling away of the truth, even by those who once held to the truth of the Reformed and Presbyterian faith, a truth that God is God and men are sinners in need of pure grace and saved by faith alone in Christ alone. God to depart from that is such a terrible thing. Judgment begins in the house of God. And woe to us if we would part, depart doctrinally or practically from those truths, not caring for them or losing our first love. God in heaven, what a shame upon us when we don't love you as we ought. And we're not so militant as we ought to be, not so peaceful as we ought to be, not so reflecting Jesus as we ought to do. God, bless and touch our hearts. Restore the song. May it be vibrant, full of life, the joy, the song of salvation of Moses and especially of that lamb. In Jesus' name, amen. Your offering at this time for the general fund will be received.
Number 213, versification of Psalm 107, rebels who had dared to show. Let's sing, sing the three stanzas, 213. Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Exodus and chapter 15. I want to read the context here, chapter 14, verse 30, 31, then Chapter 15, 1 through 21, records the song of the children of Israel. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces and in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath, it consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. 
The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Thus far we read this Amazing word of God, true, because the God of truth has breathed it forth, inspired it, and given it to us as a great testimony of his greatness and the greatness of our salvation. So we see here, don't we, Israel leaves Egypt with a song, bursting in praise to God, Moses and the children of Israel, Miriam and the women, they follow with song. And This is significant, to say the least. The first song this is of the entire Bible. First song this is of the people of God. Many allusions as well are made to this song and parts of it in the Psalms. It will be, however, Israel's last song until the monarchy of the sweet singer of Israel, King David, and the psalmist David. So instead of a song, an exodus song, a happy song, Israel will be full of complaint and a longing to go back to Egypt. This proves, in fact, that one can take the people out of Egypt, but one cannot take Egypt out of the people. God, of course, can, but he waits until we get to heaven. We would hear this song now. It's a miracle, really is. It's a miracle of faith. It's just as much a miracle that God works as the other ten mighty plagues. It rises from faith in God and Moses, because look at the context here, which I read. The Lord saved Israel that day in chapter 1430 out of the hand of the Egyptians. He saw, Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then... Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. That's the context. The miracle of faith, the miracle that they had seen done for them is now in the people of God themselves. Moses and the children of Israel sing this miraculous song. So with a song, Israel leaves Egypt. With a sermon, we would leave the exodus for now in the gospel redemption of salvation in Jesus and from sin, which I trust we've, been, we've seen pictured in this wonderful exodus from the land of bondage. We leave the exodus too with the song, or we should, only may we not be as this Old Testament people. Beloved, this is what this sermon is for. That we might sing on the other side of our exodus from sin through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And that we might never stop singing. That the song may continue among us. We want to show our joy in God. We, the congregation, those who are visiting, those who may be hearing in on the internet. This sermon is for you to sing. Whether you're far or near from God It's for you to believe and to sing with us and to hear God's word song, Israel's song at the sea. 
want to consider three things about this. First of all, that this is unto the glorious Lord God. And then secondly, there's an 11th plague. Did you know that? There's an 11th plague, and it's here before our eyes. And if we'd hear the song, we could hear that 11th plague. And then finally, this is so that there might be known a great sing-along, a great singing together. And this is alluded to in the fact that Miriam and the women, they follow the lead of Moses and the men, and they join in singing. And beloved, I dare say that this is so that we sing along with them. It's the same song after all, and we have much more to sing about. And so Israel's song at the sea, it's unto the glorious Lord God. Look, the Moses and the children of Israel, they sang this song to the Lord, to him, about him, unto his praise. And then they say the following words that are recorded for our edification. Striking that four times the glory of the Lord is mentioned here seems to be the theme of this song. In verse 1, I will sing to the Lord for he's triumphed gloriously. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces and in the greatness of your excellence. You've overthrown those who rose against you. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. And then verse 21, here's where Miriam and the women take up the same song, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider, he's thrown into the sea. Striking also about this song, again, kind of by way of introduction to this first point, 12 times the word Lord is used. And if you notice, in, usually in Bibles, it's either Jehovah or it's capitalized, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means it's a special name for Lord, not just power and Adonai power, God power, but he is the covenant God who's remembered here in praise 12 times in these in the 18 verses that really comprise the psalm, or it is a psalm, but the, the chapter. Besides that, 33 times, this is for those into arithmetic and calculating things, though if just once, that's important enough in the Bible, but 33 times for emphasis, pronouns reference God, and they reference him who is the Lord, who is glorious. That is, where the name is not mentioned, the psalmist sings to you, O God, or that he has done great things. One thing noticeable and very important for us to remember in this uh, context of our society, God is not referenced as a she, an it, or a they. He is glorified, the wonderful God of our salvation. Israel's song, therefore, is God-centered. It's theological. God is on their minds. They've seen his great works. They can do no otherwise than to believe and to sing this spirit-inspired uh, psalm. It amounts to a psalm of the greatness of God. And note what is kind of a central text here. Central theme is God who's glorious. But then this question in verse 11, who is like you, O Lord? capitals, O Jehovah, among the gods, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. The Israelites have gotten it straight. Finally, after this years in bondage and after having gone after the gods of Egypt, which were decimated along with the Egyptians themselves, they come to the clear resolution and, and understanding that God is the only God. The God who has been on their side all along hasn't departed from them, though they have departed from him. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now the 12 sons of Jacob in their generations for some 430 years, he's been their God. In fact, for eternity, he's been God. That's what we mean by God, children. He is the God who has no beginning, no end. He's eternal. 
beyond the beginnings that we have or that things that are growing and things that are hatching have in this season of growth in the spring and the summer of 2022. God is the God who is the fount of being, the source of it all. Like a stream has its source way up in the mountains and hardly anyone knows exactly where that source is. There's a mystery about it. Well, so nobody knows the mystery of that being of beings who is God who has no source. There's no mountain higher than God down which flows some being of some other being. He's God, God most high. This is what the question means. Who is like you, O Jehovah, among the gods? Meaning, nobody. Nobody's like a God. And gods, we should know from the Bible, are really no gods. There's no other gods than God. But people make them up. They like to think that somebody besides the true God is on the throne. You know why? Usually, if not always, it's not just to think about other gods, but it's to do something that they know God is not happy with. And so people invent their gods to serve their gods, but to be free, they think, to serve themselves and themselves to be as God. For he who makes the God, of course, is God. But God is not makeable. He is not created. He is the creator himself, than which there is no greater. This is Moses here leading the way in this song back to what he found out in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 in the burning bush. The very beginning of this whole thing, after Moses had messed it up and had to spend 40 years in the backside of the desert that he might learn to be humble before God and a faithful leader to God of the people of God, that is where he beheld and was apprised of the fact that Jehovah is the I am that I am. We think it's a funny name, but it's simply God describing in human language. He's the fount of being. He is who he is. And everything that is besides him has its source in this God who is simply because he is. And this means he's absolutely perfect. He's not only eternal with no beginning, but he's infinite in his holiness Glorious in holiness, the Bible says here. Fearful in praises, doing wondrous things. Of course, he's God. And look what he's just done at the Red Sea. He's commanded the waves to, to, to back up for Israel. And then he smashed them down upon Pharaoh and his host. The glory of Egypt. He's the God who's perfectly good and perfectly wise and perfectly perfect. The God of an eternal will who does Whatever he wants in heaven and on earth, among beings seen, among beings not seen, he is working right now his counsel in everything and in Supreme Court decisions. And if they didn't go our way, he'd still be working in and over them. He's God. And he's working in your life and he's working among the ants and he's working among the aardvarks and he's working in the springtime and the sun and the rain. He's God. He's really God. And this is what we have to see here is the beginning of true religion. The acknowledgement that God is God, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods, glorious in power and in holiness. And besides that, our God. Isn't that amazing? The wonder of God is that he's God and ours. The condescension of God, big word for God coming down, is celebrated in the, in the Bible. Isaiah 57, for example, he dwells and inhabits eternity, and yet he condescends to dwell among the sons of men, the, the lowly, the humble. That's, that's you, humble sinner, and that is also who I am. But God is our God. He's our Savior God. He's presented here as Israel's Savior, Savior God in himself, and in his doing, second point of this main point, he is glorious in himself, in his holiness, and he does things. And in fact, this is what is celebrated here, the God who does things. The gods are not and they do not, but God is and he does things. 
So Moses can say, I will sing to the Lord for he's done something. Namely this, he's triumphed gloriously. He's thrown horse and rider into the sea. He saved us. He led us. And he has this pillar of cloud and fire at once that is reminding us that he's behind this great parting of the Red Sea miracle. So God does wondrous things in creation out of nothing. He says, let there be and there is. Again, there is nothing besides God, but he says, there's going to be something, let there be and there is light and there is this and there is that. And then he says, may it continue to be. That's what providence is. God is speaking continually by his word. And if he stops speaking, you know what happened to everything? We simply fade away into nothingness because we have no existence besides God. God is the God who maintains us. He rules us by his power and his providence and upholds us by the word of his power. Wonderful God is this God, and especially he does great things to save his people. God is God, and he saves. He commands salvation out of nothing because we're just sinners. So out of an evil heart, he makes a good heart and breathes upon the bones of the, the dry bones in the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel says, and by his spirit called from the four winds joins the word, and so there's life and there's revitalization. There is this wonderful, amazing communion with the God whose life, the God of our life. Well, what is celebrated here, most people won't like. It's not even the deliverance that's celebrated in this song as much as the destruction of Pharaoh and his host. Over and over, the great hand of God, the right hand of God in his power overthrowing the mighty army of Egypt, the glory of the country of Egypt, and the destruction of that glory, that's emphasized. This God who's a man of war, Interesting explanation of the Lord. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Describes God not as some mere man, but as this man among men, this God who's man. And he speaks in terms we can understand so that we know we have to do here with someone who's among us, not just this ethereal being, but he's among us and he's fighting as it would be shown to the Israelites as they come into the Land of promise, there's this captain of the Lord of hosts, even Jesus. And he's there, and he's there to fight for the children of Israel. So God fights for the children of Israel here. We've seen this warrior God in our congregation. In the ten mighty plagues, and then this wonderful parting of the Red Sea, there is this God who's for Israel and righteously indignant at the wicked whose heart he is hardened with his power and holy justice he overthrows. This God is seen as this God who destroys Egypt and his host looking out of the fire, not abandoning his holiness, but looking out of that pillar of fire, looking down upon it, we saw last time, troubling the wheels of the troublers of Israel, messing up the war machines of this this renowned army and its charioteers so that they cannot gain the victory over the people of God. And then there's this God who looks down upon that people, that dreadful people, that, those enemies of the people of God. And as they're recognizing for once that God is fighting for Israel and not for them, and they're fleeing, he sends the waves crashing down upon them and there they are drowned and dropped like a stone in the bottom of the sea. So there's this God. And there's this song to this God who is the God who is great and who does great things, especially the salvation of Israel through the destruction of the enemy. Now, beloved, right away as we do here, in the first point usually, I want to make a point of this. This all is revelation of Jesus. Jesus Christ is God, and he's pictured here in Moses, mediating the salvation of the people of God. Now, 
children, I'll just explain to you, of course, Jesus isn't born yet when this is being written, this is happening. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later only would Jesus be born. But he's there in promise. He himself is the eternal God who is God the Son, has no beginning. And he's here in this picture of himself, even Moses. And remember Moses, he's given this rod. And he's told to hold forth this rod in his right hand. And that symbolized the right hand of God. And that's emphasized in this, in this chapter. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemies, the enemy in pieces. Verse 6 and verse 12. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. The right hand of God. You know, beloved, that is Jesus. Jesus is the right hand man of God. He's the great son of God. God has created all things that by him and for him all things might be created that he might have the preeminence. Also this picture of our redemption recorded in this song and the glorious thing that happened. The theological explanation for it is a Christological one. Jesus is in Moses. He would be in David, the son of man. And in him, This is how we understand the gospel of Exodus, not just a book of Israel's deliverance, good for the Jews to read. It's not even good for the Jews to read if they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the fulfillment of all this as much as they don't believe the lamb of Isaiah 53. They don't believe the lamb is Jesus of the 10th plague. And they don't believe the song of Moses is the song of Moses and of the lamb, or it's just a song that you might sing of heroes in a bar somewhere. This is the Holy Gospel. And wherever there's God, there's Jesus, because he's triune and he's the God of our salvation. And that's why in the fullness of time, his glory is revealed, the glory that's celebrated here. God reveals his glory. We Behold his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John says. And we behold the brightness of the glory of God in Jesus, Hebrews says. And in him dwells all the fullness of the body, uh, of the Godhead bodily, Colossians teaches us. So the New Testament verifies for us that there is a glory of God for us today, fully revealed in Jesus Christ fully revealed in his deliverance of his people, chosen in him, for whom he dies, and fully revealed in him who crushes those who oppose him and his bride, the church. And one day he will come to avenge himself upon his enemies, to show he is the savior of his people, and he will show that he is this glorious God who gives the victory and who is God of gods and God of gods and Savior of saviors, and Lord of lords and King of kings. The heart of our song. So we sing. My second point. Now I want to say of this, that this is the 11th plague. I'm bold to say here. This is the 11th plague. Here's why. The song of Israel is itself a wonder of grace. And all those plagues upon Egypt, which were for the salvation of the people, were also wonders upon Egypt, or upon Israel, in the land of Egypt. So this parting of the Red Sea is another miracle. You might say that's another plague. But I choose to say that this song is. And it's because, in the first place, it is what those plagues centrally were. That is, wonders of grace for the salvation of the people of God. That's how God works, you understand. He's not just interested in plaguing people and in executing justice upon wicked people, though he does this. And though it's his sovereign mercy and good pleasure according to which he does this. But especially he's interested, even in 
legs, even in the fall of Adam, to show just how God he is in saving a people out of that mess, out of that bondage, out of that total depravity, out of that guilt, on a cross, through a resurrection from the dead, the God of the impossible will be known in his Son. So it's a wonder of grace even that Israel's singing, even as all being has its source in God, so every true and godly song has its source in God, the God of the Exodus. Remember, he's the God of the Exodus. They're singing to the God of the Exodus. He commends his love, after all, by a lamb's blood, and he confirms his love now to his people by shedding abroad his love in their hearts. Israel, right now, is showing that it's a people loved of God. Not all of them, many, many, and there's a, there's a mixed multitude besides, are just fakes. They're just going along because this is the thing to do. You go to church, and you, you look the part, and you sing, you open your mouth, but your heart's not in it. But the true Israel of God, they've been given faith. As we read before, the context, Israel saw the great work of the Lord, which he'd done in Egypt. So they feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. This is a wonder. Pharaoh, obviously, was not given faith. He was just hardened in his unbelief. So were the Egyptians. And when they gave willingly their their gold and their silver and their uh, costly raiment to the Israelites, this was only because they feared for their lives and now they wanted it back. Israel's given faith, though. Now, they had little faith, but they had faith. And their song reflects this faith. And this is exactly, beloved, something that shows in this picture here what the Lamb does. Because it's a song connected with the Lamb's blood being shed and the angel of death passing over the houses, of course. The tenth plague, as we've seen, is the plague of all the plagues. It's the central plague. If there were nine plagues, Israel could not have been delivered. If there were 900 plagues, Israel could not and would not have been delivered except there be the blood of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. The wonderful picture of Jesus, just so beloved, it is impossible that there be any plagues or even wonders on this earth. If there's not the wonder of Jesus, no one's going to heaven. No one will please God. Jesus must be our righteousness. They're singing here of the Lamb. They're singing of the God of the Lamb. They're singing of the God of wonder who said, I'm passing you by. I kill the firstborn of Egypt. I kill all mankind except those and those families that are covered by the blood of Jesus. And I do this not as some ogre, but as a holy and just God. The song itself, connected with the lamb, is part of the lamb's work. That's what God does in salvation of us. Jesus is crucified for us. And as we've been seeing in our discussion of the Heidelberg Catechism's doctrine, there is this sanctification that follows. And sanctification includes a song. And sanctification includes joy. And sanctification is centered on the the Lamb and the righteousness of the Lamb and the God who justifies sinners, even the ungodly. For Jesus' sake, And because he's the perfect substitute and because now he who's in heaven applies what he's accomplished for us on the cross and this application includes a song. There must be a song. The song of faith and of Moses. Psalm 112 speaks of this in verse 106 in verse 12. Then they believed his words and they sang his praise. Their response It was a song, just to mention some things about this song here, a song which I would call a light song, not a ditty, not some children's rhyme or something, 
but a light song that is sung in the light of light, in what they knew of God. It's a song based on what they had seen. Our song is based on what is written in the word of God of the salvation of God. His all exaltation is what is written in the Bible. It's what's revealed to us in our hearts, so we sing. It is said in the word of God, it was revealed to Israel that God triumphs gloriously over his enemies and over our enemies, so we're going to sing. So we're going to be moved in our soul, our regenerated souls, animated, to be elevated in our life and in our song. This is a song that pleases God because it's this song of faith. Hebrews 11 tells us without faith it is impossible to please God. Israel was pleasing God here. And when we sing, beloved, we please God. Children, when you sing freely and loudly and however loud you want, God is happy. When you sing to his praise and you sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And you're not complaining and grumping and all of that like us parents can be sometimes, maybe regularly. God is happy when you follow the lead of God all the way to heaven where we will sing perfectly. Song of thanks this was also for Israel's now being separated soon to be established as the distinct people of God at Mount Sinai. They'll be instituted as a church, as the church, the holy nation of the Old Testament, about a month later. In preparation for them, this, they, they sing. And this is a celebration of the beginning of that separation. Look, Pharaoh and Egypt, they're past. They're dead and gone. They're no threat anymore. And God is now, you see, fulfilling his promise made in the beginning to the snake. You've got to know a lot of Old Testament history around here, don't you? Genesis 3, verse 15. God says to the snake in the mother promise, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, you shall bruise its heel. It was enmity, a spiritual separation. And if ever there was one, it's at the Red Sea. Pharaoh cannot get Israel. The devil cannot get you. No matter how bad you sin, if you're God's, how good is God to forgive? And as we said last time, you can't out sin the cross because Jesus paid it all. This separation is established here in a concrete way, and they're singing of this. And they're singing of their life, which will be wholly separate unto the Lord. Israel will dwell safely, alone. Not, of course, out of this world, though in the Old Testament, there were walls behind their cities and there was a place for them and for none of the Canaanites, a picture, however, of our spiritual separation in this world. You know you're distinct. Excuse me, you know you're distinct, don't you? Because God is. And he wants you different. Even in this world, doing the same things that the worldly people do, though with a great motive and not sinning while you're working or playing. This is a song which is a life song, as I said, this elevated expression of the animated, enlivened soul for a life of praise to God. That's what singing is. That's why we preach and we sing, I will sing of my Redeemer. It almost sounds like a song, doesn't it? Your life, how's that? Theirs was a first love song, if I could call it. You know that church in Ephesus, the church of Asia Minor, the early chapters of Revelation? Ephesus is rebuked for losing its first love. They had the other works. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans or something like that. But they left their first love. They were not so animated. They, they had come to Elam or some other problem in their life. And, and there was water that wasn't good enough to drink. And now they're in this nation, maybe, and among people in the wilderness who just don't get this. 
and they don't let us live the way we want to, and, and so we start complaining and bickering, and we're forgetting God, and we're forgetting God whose way is in the wilderness all the way to heaven. The song and the love, they fade, don't they, too often in yours truly. And I suspect in you too. But theirs is a grateful song, not only for what God did, but if you look at verses 13 through 18, they're celebrating already what God would do. You've guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. They're, well, they're not there yet. And then they're speaking of the fact that people will hear and be afraid. Verse 14, and sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. That's up in Canaan. And the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed and the mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them and all the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. Well, it hasn't happened yet. What are they doing here? Those fools predicting the future. Oh, no, beloved. This is what faith does. It hopes all things because it hopes in the one God who has said, I'm giving you the land of promise. So theirs is a grateful song for what God has done and would do in the song of a flock of the people of God led by the good shepherd, a song in which they express their greatest delight that God would lead them to his holy habitation in the land of promise, a song, a wonder of grace. But now I said this is a plague. And here's what I mean by that. The song is a plague to unbelievers. The testimony of the church in her preaching, in her singing, and in her living out Christianity is a plague upon unbelievers. Here's why. Because they hate it. And so the song, which is good and which glorifies God, it's true, becomes judgment to them. It's amazing. And God today is plaguing the land in their own unbelief. And because of their own unbelief, they don't know their own sex around here. They don't know what life is. They don't know the value of God, the reality of God. And every time we tell them that, and God tells them that, they're plagued. The wicked hear in this song of the Exodus, the song says they will, when they hear of this, they're going to tremble. They're going to tremble. One of the effects of the plague upon the nations when they hear the witness of the church is that they persecute the church. And you know, young people, especially they want to take away your song early on, they do. And they want to break up your home. And they want husbands and wives not to reconcile in the cross. And they want the young adults to give up hope of ever marrying or thinking that life has passed them by if, if they stay single. And when the doctor announces that you've got six months to live, they want us to give up and to stop singing. So many ways the wicked who are plagued want us to join in their being plagued. Misery loves company as it goes. The grand expression of the vibrant faith of the people of God, the, the world when it hears of this wants to cut off the singing. That is the vibrancy, the life, the vitality. The preaching behind it. I'll just emphasize something different. Make it the song of self, the song of man. Make your man an orator and not a mere humble preacher. Make him so that he can be more popular among the nations so many people can sing, even though the song isn't the song of the fathers. No, no biggie. We need to be up to date in all of this. And so the love of truth and the truth of love, they, they fade from our 
experience in our desire, practically and doctrinally, we, we lose it. It's no wonder that Israel here had the seed of hardening in their own lives at the side of the Red Sea. It was, as I say, this mixed multitude. But notice what Moses says as they're about to enter the promised land. Deuteronomy 29, now Moses called all Israel and said to them, you've seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet, he's talking to the second generation 40 years after the Exodus. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Oh, beloved, don't you fear that? Don't you fear apostasy? I remember when I was first converted to the great things of the gospel, and every time I sinned, I thought, oh, no, I'm done. I'll be the Antichrist. There was such hypocrites face on me and hypocrites, dead men's bones in me. No confidence in myself, nor in God, nor any real deep knowledge of the God who holds us and of the Savior who leads the way in the singing. And he will be heard his song is a prayer. Final point is this, beloved. There's a joyous sing-along. Sing along with Moses. That's what they were doing here. In Exodus chapter 15, they sing. Men sing. You can imagine. Imagine that. To be so in tune with the will of God that your song reflects it. Everything. Well, Miriam, she saw this, and she's identified here in verse 20 as the sister of Aaron, almost like she doesn't, it's impossible to associate her with that great figure Moses, even though she's the brother of, Aaron, of, of Moses. But she's just called the sister, she's the sister of Moses too. She's called the sister of Aaron, and she took a timbrel in her hand, like a tambourine maybe, and all the women went out after her with the timbrels and with the dances. And Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord, answered them. He's responding as, as, you, as they do sometimes in singing. The, the one side sings in, in, antiphonetically or whatever. And then the other side responds. And, and here they are. Sing to the Lord for he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he's thrown into the sea. Now, beloved, I want to lead us into these final statements about the song going on and not stopping ever among us. If this song will be ours, you have to follow the lead of Moses, representing Jesus, and all those Israelites who by faith believed God and left Egypt and passed through the Red Sea is dry ground. And then Mir Miriam, who followed them. We'll just be the followers. Is that good enough for you? Just be the followers. Only let it be that you sing the same song. That's what Miriam did. Just as Moses sang of the Lord who triumphed gloriously, verse 1 and 2. Miriam and the women, they sing the same song. There's nothing else to sing. I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. I will sing of Jesus, who is the same God as Moses' God. Don't change the song, beloved. There's something significant here, already at verse 2, where the singers say, The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He's my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Think about the fathers. Fathers, this refers to you, if we want to apply it right now directly to us. 
the leaders in the homes. Fathers, this would apply to the leaders in the churches, the office bearer. Fathers to Israel would probably have meant Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the, the song that, that they sang and the salvation that they knew. But this is to be, because it's for our learning, something we ought to learn from. When the church sings of Moses and the Lamb, it's an old song. When the church preaches Christian doctrine, she's preaching old doctrine. When the church exhorts people to walk in paths, they're the paths of Jeremiah 6, the old paths in which is the good way. And when the church sings the ancient of days, even the glorious God revealed in Jesus, singing an old song there, a song as far back as Moses in this first song. We sing the old song. And a plague on all the new songs that are different than the old song. Now, I'm not saying there may be no new songs, no new hymns in the church of Christ. But oftentimes, the devil sings his way into the church because he wants a song that's different than the song at the Red Sea. He wants something more about man and his experience and less about God and his glory revealed in Jesus Christ. And that's why, you know, the fathers were loath even to take hymns into the, the, the flock of all of the songs that were being written uh, the devotional songs, because they seem to steer away the people from the eminent message of the Bible. So many of them stuck with strict psalmody. I'm not for that necessarily, but there's a danger. The devil likes to sing into the church. He likes to hype up the people with a, a song that uh, uh, makes you feel good, but a song that's not to the glory of God and preaching that also is not so much to the glory of God as to how can we increase the numbers in the church of Jesus Christ and I'll tell you how we could increase our numbers here, beloved. You ready to hear? Elders, I know this is scary. But all you got to do is forget the creeds of the church, the faith of our fathers living still, the truth that's hammered out in the anvil of controversy that God only is God and that salvation is only of the will of God. It's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. And God hardens whom he wills. Pharaoh is a testimony to this. And he has mercy on whom he wills. That's the song we sing. No matter how little the modern church wants to hear this, it's the song of this man of war, this God of war, and this church militant. We are soldiers singing the song. We are peacemakers to be sure, but it's in the way of battle. So the three forms of edification are for unity, life, and hope, and a song. You see, there has to be something to it. You don't want 7-Eleven songs, do you? Seven words repeated 11 times, and on and on and on. Deep theological singing and preaching and instruction in the basic truths of the God of the Exodus. Oh, beloved, I'll leave you with this verse of the scripture which expresses what we long for. What we long for is heaven's song. In Revelation 15, 1 through 4, we read this. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, not the Red Sea, but the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord? 
and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. Beloved, sing the song of the gospel, of the exodus, of the cross, and the resurrected Savior. The song of Moses and of the Lamb. Amen. Lord, we pray you would bless us as we hear over and over now in our remembrance, in our recalling what you've just spoken so that we might sing and live and rejoice in you. Lord, keep us from dying. Keep our song from dying out, our love from missing something. Keep, Lord, your people, and we shall keep singing. This is our love, Lord, and this we know is your will for us, the God of our exodus from sin in Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Let's sing now, number 119. All ye peoples, bless our God. Uh, let's sing stanzas one and four, one and four of 119. Doxology printed in your bulletin 488. Receive God's word, beloved. You may go in peace and with a song. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.